Well, I hope it's bright enough in this room today. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're having a, a cold snap here in Europe right now. So it's very cold and uh, we've got the shutters down for the most part. Now, I've been uh, always very, very open. I'm a former sex industry worker and I was a bondage model for about 14 years. And this is uh, an example of some of my straight bondage modeling. It was done by a photographer named Erwin Cook, who had uh, a studio uh, in Soho in New York City and was very nice to work with. And my only pay for this, as far as I can recall, was uh, getting uh, this print. Um, but it was just, you know, like an afternoon's work, and he had a makeup artist there. And um, he mostly did cookbook covers, professional photographer, things like that. And what, what you see in this photo is uh, there are transparencies used. So uh, this was used um, for an artist to do a painting for a romance book cover. And actually, I don't think the book sold. And, um, wow, I can see there's a bruise on my leg down there. And, uh, now, you can't see the detail here, but this photo is damaged. And there's a paranormal connection with this photo. The top is bent down as if somebody had struck it with a hammer, which is totally weird. Um, and this is the second frame that this photo has been in. You have to understand that the reason uh, we models did a lot of work for free, um, well, back when I was doing that, is because having a nice print to put in your portfolio um, or a tear sheet or something for your portfolio was was valuable. You know, you'd go on a go-see and you'd show people what you could look like and you could get work that way. I found modeling work extraordinarily boring. Um, I only kept up with it uh, with certain clients who were particularly interesting. I did some work in movies actually um, I was an extra or whatever. Some of them were porn movies or some of them were straight movies. I don't I don't really remember. Uh, I found it very, very dull. It, it just wasn't quite for me. You know, you, it's like hurry up and wait, you know, sit there and wait all dressed up. One of the most interesting makeup jobs I ever had was a guy who worked on Satyricon by Fellini. And after he had worked me over for about two hours, I absolutely did not recognize myself. That was kind of fun. I lived in a, a very haunted apartment in Brooklyn, New York for many years. First, I lived upstairs with a roommate starting in 1980 after a disastrous divorce. Uh, my husband had made me quit my job saying he was rich and I didn't need to work. And um, when I walked out on him, uh, you know, I, I got nothing, so I was, like, unemployed. He hadn't kept up my health insurance. Um, and uh, I was homeless. And I became a sex industry worker. And he uh, was the first owner of an S&M bordello in New York that we know of. But I didn't go to work for him. I just figured, well, that's maybe something I can do. Now, I had a ghost in my apartment. And when I moved downstairs in March of 1982, the reason that the apartment was available was because the previous tenant had died. And her name was Sophie Brisman. 
and um, I think that she fell down in the bathroom and couldn't get up and her things were all still in the apartment and it was a little bit disturbing it looked as though she was using these little stubs of makeup like lipstick to write on the walls as she was dying and I think she could hear uh, the princess telephone she had ringing and couldn't get up to answer it or the doorbell ringing and couldn't get up to answer it and um, I kept hearing uh, ringing in the apartment and so did other people my subtenants and guests and spouses and stuff like that it was it was very strange so I figured well I guess I'm moving into a haunted apartment but it's pretty cheap and I always personally felt very safe in the apartment but Sophie did not well if that's who it was I mean who knows maybe my imagination did not like me to be with anybody she wanted me to be alone and I realize now she was right that my relationships were very bad and that I was being pimped and abused um, and she was trying to warn me I think now that I look back on it but I always felt very safe in the apartment and I lived there until 1994 and I sublet the place twice and yeah the uh, other subtenants had uh, one of them did have a problem with the haunting the second one I don't think did but um, her relationship broke up now here's some pornography I was in years ago um, this picture fell to the floor one night for no reason and I kept the frame here and it looks as though somebody hit it with a hammer and if it had just fallen to the floor because of an earthquake or a faulty nail or something the nail was not faulty um, I don't think you'd see this indentation in the top like that it's a little bit dusty um, and the photo got a little bit scratched and of course the glass broke and the original mat was uh, damaged so I had it redone some years later but I've kind of kept this picture of myself as memory not only of, of my modeling career such as it was which was just basically to earn pin money um, because I wasn't tall enough or skinny enough or beautiful enough oh it's funny uh, they used to use my body parts <laughs> you know they liked my hands and my hair and my butt so <laughs> you know I got a lot of work with with my ass showing there sometimes the breasts which were very small and that surprised me but I didn't develop breasts until it was about 30 and um, I found out after well while I was leaving the apartment I found out that um, this one guy uh, who had been my close friend for years Angelo had never had a night's sleep in the place because as soon as I drop off to sleep he could hear somebody walking around in the living room and he always took care to lock up and latch the apartment carefully and uh, he was very 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 frightened by uh, you know the heavy footsteps and my neighbor downstairs um, actually ended up taking me to court because I was single at that time and she insisted that I was walking around in the apartment all day in high heels and I was like look I do the nine to five in Manhattan I'm, I'm not here the address was 10 Ocean Parkway uh, a, a big old building with an interesting history and so these are some of my paranormal thoughts um, I did see a ghost in the apartment finally in July of 1994 with my current husband um, 
I had stupidly left some voodoo candles burning and uh, it was about seven feet tall and gray and it was like a man in a hat like in Hasidic Jewish clothing and um, he nearly died a few weeks later and he could see it very directly and I could see it through the crack in the door it was very 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 tall there was definitely something there coming in from the living room to check on us sitting there watching TV in the bedroom on the mattress on the floor so I hope this is coherent I will try to put up another I was for sale soon when I feel up to it I think you you can live without it for the moment and um, I hope this makes sense uh, by the way the the lady who took me to court was so unreasonable that the judge threw her case out um, but you know the poltergeist activity in that apartment over the years was incredible crashing noises oh she would prank me I'd be in the bathtub and I'd hear the phone ringing and I'd get up out of the bath and you know the the phone had not been been ringing the answering machine had had not registered anything um, I always uh, you know I still have a, a couple of Sophie's things with me uh, a couple of shot glasses a juice reamer um, stuff like that she was an original tenant of the building and after her son and uh, husband went away for whatever reasons she moved into a smaller apartment and died alone and it was it was very sad you know all right see you later